I mean, look, if you if you're fortunate enough to you know have access to somebody uh, like that could actually mentor you, that you could go work for directly, and, and maybe it's free. You're volunteering your time um, to work with them. It's it's money well spent, or or yeah, well, money well spent because you're not getting paid, but but you're going to learn a ton. Um, like yeah, like I'll give you an example. Like the the Poliquin seminars that I did back in the late '90s. Like I felt like I got more out of that than I ever got out of any school. Welcome. To Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity. With your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So, this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. This episode is brought to you by Health IQ, a life insurance company that helps health conscious people like runners, cyclists, weightlifters, high intensity training participants, and more get a lower rate on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com forward slash C warrior to support the show and see if you qualify. If you take care of yourself, you do smart strength training, you eat well, and your life insurance company doesn't seem like they care, there's an answer for you. Health IQ actually gives savings to people who take care of themselves. About 56 percent of health iq customers say between four and 33 percent on their life insurance because of this health iq customers can save up to a third because physically active people have a 56 percent lower risk of heart disease 20 percent lower risk of cancer and 58 percent lower risk of diabetes compared to people that are inactive but your life insurance company probably just doesn't care you care and there are companies out there that care to see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash C Warrior or mention the promo code C Warrior when you talk to a Health IQ agent. Hey guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training for maximum gains and how to start and grow your high intensity training business. My former guests include HIT experts like Dr. Doug McGuff and Drew Bay, paleo pioneers Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, Zero Carb Carnival Dr. Sean Baker, successful strength training entrepreneurs like Luke Carlson and Roger Schwab, time management experts, HIT bodybuilders, New York Times bestselling authors, and everything in between. I'm very excited about this one, guys. My next guest is Craig Hubert, and hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. He did teach me how to pronounce his name, and hopefully I got that right. Um, Craig's been a PT since 97 and a licensed kinesi therapist since 2002. Craig was inspired to pursue a fitness career after being mesmerized watching his own ACL surgery, which sounds incredibly weird to me because I thought that would probably have the, the adverse effect. Um, 
<laughs> Craig started training clients in small gyms and, and private studios and then created his own mobile in-home high-intensity training business. Uh, Craig then went on to start his own high-intensity training facility, which he currently runs. I'm really excited to bring you this episode. Craig was a really fun dude. And this is a masterclass on how to start and grow a mobile HIT business. We cover Craig's journey, which includes how he discovered high intensity training, which is hilarious, by the way, exactly how to start and run a mobile in home high intensity training business. And we go into a ton of detail in terms of the equipment and tools you need to get started, how to tailor workouts to your clients, and exactly how to instruct them for a productive workout. And we talk about some really good tips on growing your business in terms of how to get started from scratch with no qualifications or personal training experience, service distance, so the importance of centralizing and finding a high profit area and finding the right clientele, how to market your business, how to figure out pricing, scaling, and potentially looking at something like online coaching where you can scale your time and uh, provide services, uh, distance services to your clients. Um, and then also, if you so choose, how to transition from a mobile hit business to operating and opening a high intensity training facility and much, much more. For all of the show notes and links for this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Craig. And for all other episodes, <laughs> for all other episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. Please do um, check out the show notes for this episode because there'll be some additional tips there. And if Craig has kindly created a video demonstrating the workouts that we discussed. So if you go to uh, that blog post, you can find all of that there. Don't forget to hang around at the end of this episode for your free gift from me. And now I give you how to build a mobile in-home high-intensity training business with Craig Hubert. Craig, welcome to Corporate Warriors. Pleasure having you on the show. Hey, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it, uh, Lawrence. You are most welcome. So, um, I, as we were t talking about just now, um, you know, we, you reached out to me on email and I was fascinated by your background building your own uh, mobile uh, body weight for the most part and um, high intensity yeah. training business, you know, working with people in their homes to help them get into shape. Um, and, you know, with, with that, I wanted, to, I was keen to get you on the show to ask you some questions about, you know, how you started that business um, and just walk us through, you know, what, how, how it came to be. I'd love for you to just provide kind of a, a summary in terms of how you got into that from the beginning, then how it evolved. Yeah, for sure. Um, so basically, I did my first um, certification in 1997 uh, with the American Council on Exercise. And at that time, I would just return back to school. Uh, I had blown out my ACL playing rugby and watched the surgery. And I just was fascinated. So I, had, I was obviously working out at the time. Um, I'm five foot eight. Uh, the let's call it the fittest I ever was was about 160 pounds at around six percent body fat. Um, and the injury actually came at that peak. So just somebody falling into the leg, blew out the knee, did the surgery. I was bartending at the time, uh, and that, like I said, going back to school. Um, but it was my mother that said, look, there's a gym where I train. They're doing a certification. I went and did that, got hired by them, and that started it. Uh, so that would have been, like, let's say, 97, 98, 99. Uh, at that time, I was just doing seminar after seminar. Uh, a lot of the Charles Poliquin stuff at the time was big. Uh, the functional fitness trend had just kind of come in. So it was like Swiss balls everywhere. So it was, you know, uh, dumbbell presses on balls, squatting on balls, dumbbell curls on balls. It, it, you know, <laughs> it, it was fun. But obviously, looking back, it, you know, probably not the most productive way to be training. Um, the programs that I were, that I was designing for clients at that point in time, uh, were kind of falling more into the traditional, let's say, you know, three on two off kind of splits where you wanted the clients in there five days a week. Um, and what I started noticing at that point in time was people weren't sticking with it. Uh, you know, it, they would be good for a week. They do their five workouts then the following week, they'd hit two or, they, you know, maybe they'd get three the week after that. It's one, then they're on vacation uh, and they don't do anything on vacation. And the problem is, is that, you know, we can t talk about this after, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with volume if you do the workouts, right? But the problem is that for most people, we don't have the time. And so that kind of got the wheels back then in motion in terms of, you know, there was something wrong with what I was doing. 
so I'd gone from that first gym. It closed. I moved to the next gym. Uh, was, was literally down the street. Stayed there for a few years uh, and ended up at a personal training studio uh, just west of Montreal. Um, and I started getting requests from clients that weren't happy uh, where they were training. And initially, they wanted to know if I would go to a different gym. I didn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, but they then asked me if I wanted to train them at their homes. So it started off with one client, two clients, and all of a sudden I was getting referrals and I transitioned out of working fitness studios and went solely into in-home training. Um, where that kind of got me into hit was I was still doing hour-long sessions. I was driving all over the place. Uh, I was making money doing it, but just factoring in the time, it was, you know, um, well, you read uh, Ferris's book, right? The four hour, bo- uh, four hour work week. Right. Yeah. And he's talking, he, I think he was making the, the comment about lawyers and, you know, how many hours versus, you know, what their actual, what their actual salary is if they're working 120 hours plus a week or whatever this number is worth the time. And I realized the amount of time I spent driving in the car uh, had to be factored into my pricing. And I also realized that an hour for most of my clients, you know, they wanted me to go to the home because it was convenient for time. And so the first step was I looked at it and I said, well, the hour is not working for most people. Let's cut it down. So I cut it down to 30 minutes. That was way better. I got more clients from doing it that way. Um, the driving was still an issue and we can, we'll address that after, but what ended up happening was in between, I ended up at uh, a local bookstore. So I had a break. I went in and I see this book, Body by Science, you know, touting 12 minutes uh, fitness, you know, uh, per week. And I, and I was just like, oh, this is bullshit. Like, how can anybody, you know, write this? <laughs> so I didn't know who Dr. McGuff was at the time, but I knew who John Little was. Um, so previously, I'll backstep a little bit. Uh, at one point in time, I was reading Muscular Development Magazine, and I saw some articles by Mike Menzer. Um, so I was reading his stuff, and when I was 18 or 19, I had bought Ellington Darden's high-intensity strength training, or high-intensity training. It was a picture of Sean Ray, bodybuilder Sean Ray on the front. And I had followed that with decent results uh, for probably 8 to 12 weeks. I didn't follow the whole program, but but that was my first foray into, into HIT. Then Menzer's articles, so there was all these little seeds that had been planted. When I read Body by Science, it was like a light bulb just going off in my head. And it was answering a ton of questions that I had, specifically with the reasons why my clients weren't sticking with programs, why they weren't necessarily getting the results I thought they should be. Uh, and it just opened up a completely different thought process. And I literally took the in-home business and, and flipped it to high-intensity strength training within, I think, a couple of weeks. And I just changed it. Read the book, tried, to, like, tried working out myself to get a feel for how this was going to work. And then I, I just kind of uh, implemented it on the go. That's awesome. Yeah, I re- it made me laugh out loud when I read that email about how you f- you initially reacted to the Body by Science cover. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that was it, right? Like, well, you, I mean, I, I think a lot of people that weren't familiar with it were probably looking at it the same way. And if, if you didn't really know HIT, then it was like, come on, really? You can't, you can't advertise that. That's garbage. Mm, yeah. Exactly. And lo and behold. But very true, um, which is the thing, right? It's, uh, it's not a, necessarily a false statement. No, not at all. And, and you know, I, I, I kind of – I think one of the last emails I sent you, I made a little comment about periodization after listening to um, – because I listened to Gary Knight's uh, – you had him on. And I look, I think periodization works, um, and I've seen it work, and I've used it, but it kind of goes back to the same the same issue of time. And, and like, I have a cli- – I had a client – I was working for a, a gym. I was – technically the head trainer there called progressive hit and we had a guy that was in downtown montreal we had a guy coming in every five weeks he lived about seven hours away so he would come in when he had a business uh, a business meeting in, in in downtown montreal this guy put on eight pounds of muscle in about eight weeks training once every five weeks he did nothing else and he and now he ate well once every five or, days you mean no 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 once every five weeks what i yeah, that was my reaction. He, low body fat. He swore he did nothing. I'm like, come on, you, you got to be training. You got to be doing something. He's like, no, I go for walks. But he ate incredibly well. He had an incredible view of the world and on life, like stress-free, great guy. Genetically, obviously, he's an outlier. But the point for me, the point is, is that there's this guy like it, you know, you can't just, dis- what's the word I want? You can't dispute the numbers. 
you know, um, like I tracked everything. We measured his body fat using uh, the body metrics uh, 2D ultrasound, and he dropped body fat by a couple percentages. He was lean as it already, and, and he put on eight pounds on the scale, the same scale. Like I, it's not his scale at home to our scale at the gym. Was so, it noticeable, the, the, the aesthetically? He, yeah, because after about, I think it was around his fourth session when he came in, I looked at him and I'm like, is it my imagination? Are you bigger? And he's like, yeah, my shirts are a little tighter. And, and, and I'm, and I'm look, at, I'm not a big guy. I've never been a big guy. And I'm sitting there cursing him. I'm like, <laughs> and, you know, and he's not 25. He was 30. I think he was around 36, 37 at the time. So it's not like we can attribute it to youth. You know, it's, it, it was frustrating. But, but the point being that I had this guy doing once every, you know, five weeks and he was getting great results. I had a client doing once every 10 days. I tried to take her to twice weekly to see if we would see any kind of difference. There was nothing. There was no point in her doing the once, uh, the twice a week every seven days because she wasn't making any better improvements than she was once every 10. Conversely, I have a guy that I see three times a week, currently not really what I would call hit, but you know, 30 minutes, he's in and out. Um, and he's, he's leaps and bounds, but I think maybe that's also just the fact that we changed up the program drastically over what we were doing for the longest period of time. So anyway, it's kind of a tangent, but no, it's interesting. I just wanted to, to go into that a little bit. Um, but no, I, obviously I've got a ton of questions about, um, body weight, uh, sorry about the, um, in-home training business. Yeah. So tell us, walk us through like, you know, how it would go from start to finish. So you'd go into someone's home. How would you actually construct the workout and then deliver it and instruct and, and so on? Okay. So, um, it would always depend on the person. Um, if it was somebody that I was already transitioning, it was a lot easier. So if that was, if I was already working with them when I did the, the transition to, to high intensity training, it was a kind of a, I didn't really have to pitch it. They were sort of just, you know, like putty in my hands, like, yeah, do what you want. It's, you know, if, they, if this is what you think is going to work for me, then great. Um, and there was no, uh, no resistance. Um, after that, it was a lot of referrals. So, like, I, I don't do any advertising. I'm, I'm sure you tried finding me on social media when you're trying to get some information on me. Other than I, I have a personal Facebook account, but otherwise, you know, my LinkedIn, I never touch. Uh, I'm not really around. Like, I'm not there. So, my business has always been just word of mouth. Um, so, I would walk in the door. I would explain what we were going to do and the whys. Um, everybody that was calling me for in-home training was always uh, concerned with time. So that was my, that was my in. Um, Skyler mentioned it uh, on the podcast where he said, you can't sell hit because nobody really cares. Um, and, and for the most part, uh, he's right. Nobody, nobody does unless you're geeking out on it like we do. Right. Uh, but I think we're a subset of, of the population that really cares about the details. At the end of the day, most people want the results. And so you can, if you don't have the before and afters, or if you don't have the stuff to fall onto and show them pictures or whatever, then it's just how you pitch it. Um, so I would start with time. You know, it's it's a far more effective way in 30 minutes to do a workout than what we've been doing before. Um, I would push the safety end of things all the time uh, because most of the people that I would see for whatever reason, uh, it could be previous sports injuries, it could just be from a lack of activity, a lack of use that, you know, problems with their shoulders, with their knees, with their lower backs. So safety was was paramount. Uh, and I would push that angle in, in a big way. Because I think for, for me, that's really what the draw was for hit. It was the time and, and the and the safety concerns. Because um, knock on wood, I've never had a client injured. And I'd really like to continue that trend. And hit was a perfect, a perfect fit for that. Um, so once we would start, if they had some piece of cardio equipment, I always warmed them up. Just as a way of kind of, I would use that couple of minutes just to talk to them, find out what their week was like. Did they sleep? Um, I don't have a, a set way of doing evaluations with a client. Um, it's sort of, if, as soon as, you know, I, at that time it would be if I walk, as soon as I walked in the door, if I haven't seen you before, I'm, I'm looking to see, you know, how you walk, how you bend, how you move. Are you right hand dominant? Do, am I seeing a bit of a postural shift where maybe you're leaning forward with one shoulder or the other every time you, you, you know, you stand, squat, whatever. Um, so just, uh, I'll back up a little bit because I forgot to mention this. So my background in terms of education is specifically something called kinesotherapy, which is a branch of massage therapy, but it's effectively, um, I can do postural assessments, muscle testing, uh, myofascial release, craniosacral. So those are all the things I was trained in. So I have that advantage going in. Um, so it would be a very informal way of evaluating the client to then determine if there's something specific I need to choose um, 
for exercises beyond sort of like let's say the big five so your push your pull your you know your squat and, and whatnot um if i saw something where there's a some kind of deviation uh let's say it's something something glaring that i can't ignore because sometimes you can work around right um, we'll work on that first and then we'll play with range of motion on different exercises so as an example if i know you have a bad knee um, but i know i can get you to a chair level depth of squatting it might be something like a static hold over that chair, working on aligning the spine and staying upright like 90 degrees. So getting you to just just hold that position. It assumes the client is deconditioned in the first place because, you know, for yourself or for you know, myself, we're not, you know, you're, it's going to be a very long set. It's going to be a long time under tension doing it that way. It's not going to work. If there are no issues, then we'll start with full body weight squats. If I see at around the two minute mark, you know, things are still going, I'm going to cut the range of motion. We're going to do the bottom end, assuming you can get to the bottom end. Um, and then we'll work that bottom range. And usually if, if for most people, like you do it all the time, you know, that bottom, <laughs> you know, those, those six inches, it's, it's horrible. It's an Simple awful fest. feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, and and you and you'll you'll kill the set within seconds, right? And they're just they're dying. Um, so I would do something like that. Um, I would always bring. So I had a TRX I would bring with me, sort of the first generation of them. Um, and I would have some rubber tubing. I used to have uh, power block dumbbells. So they're adjustable, but dumbbells. I had to, my set. I think was from five to fifty pounds, which for the people that I was seeing, it was it was plenty. Um, so I'd bring those in as well. So depending if I if I found like okay, they can't do a push up, they they can't do proper squats. I would use mechanical loading as a way of of getting where I wanted them to go, and then try to transition them so that they could do their push ups and they can do their. So so the progression really always uh, was very much to the individual. I don't know if that. You know, no, cleared it up or made it more complicated, but no, that was a great intro to the workout. So, can you walk us through what an entire workout would look like, like a typical workout, uh, in terms of uh, and, and in the detail you just did? So, the way you described the squat and how you would how you would actually um, change it in order to meet their their needs at that time. Um, okay, could you do that for like the whole workout? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, let's well, well let's okay so we'll walk in uh hi how are you you know i do the whole shtick with them talk about their weekend listen to them complain about their spouses and then and then we get started um so i would generally speaking like to start with the, the body weight squat stuff and then i'll move them to the ground so let's we'll, we'll try to use it on the assumption that there's no injuries all right uh, or nothing that would need to be modified to suit them per se so if i start with the body weight squat um, we'll, we'll assume also that this client is more of a beginner to intermediate. So what I'm going to have them do is I'm going to have them go in and I'll start with a 10, 10 cadence. So I will work off of that, uh, for the first couple of workouts. So, uh, from a periodized approach, I play with the cadence with my clients. So I might do 10, 10 for a six week period. I might transition with, let's say a 90 second rest between exercises that can transition down depending on what their goals are and what we're trying to accomplish. If it's a sporting need, if it's, you know, if it's a bikini, you know, bathing suit kind of season, um, I'll compress that and turn it into more of a, a metabolic workout as opposed to just kind of a strength workout. If uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but, um, and then I'll change the cadence. So it might be four four, it might be five five. I've done uh, something quicker where it's like a three three two. So like a three second on the negative, uh, a three second pause on the bottom position or on the stretch, and then and then two seconds on the way up, uh, depending. So, but f for this, let's go ten ten. So I get the client started. Um, I'm going to have them squat facing the wall uh, if there's no resistance. And the reason for that is. Um, a lot of people will cheat with a forward body lean. And what happens when they fatigue is they're going to drive up with the hips first, all right? And then they're going to come up with the upper body, which kind of defeats the purpose. I'm so guilty so, of doing that myself. Yeah. Well, well it's, it's, it's just natural as soon as you start burning out, right? So I keep them off the wall. Um, and it ends up being a nice flexibility exercise at the same time for people that are tight. So you can actually use that for uh, mobility purposes as opposed to just fatiguing the tissue um but in, you know in our case we're, we're going to beat the crap out of the tissue so have them face the wall they're going to maintain that position they're going to go down on the 10 even though it's a 10 0 10 0 i always have them pause at the bottom making sure that they're set in the hole and then have them come up so they're going to go there till complete failure 
if I'm so inclined and they've got the energy and the workout at this point, it's the first exercise, if it's going well, I'm going to back them off the wall and give them a little bit of a freestyle. In other words, just acting kind of like a drop set, if you want on a, using a, you know, a, a selectorized machine, I'll have them do half range of motion on the top end uh, with a little bit more of a cadence, a little bit more, we'll call it a pump if you want, just to burn things out. And usually what I'll do is after I get about 10 reps out of them there, I'm going to let them drop below 90 degrees at the hip. And at that point, they're usually going to fall over. Um, so just as a caveat for anybody doing in-home training, um, the environment is obviously not going to be as ideal as it would be in a gym, right? So there's always, like Skylar had mentioned it, there's always distractions around. You need to clear some space because, you know, things like squatting, I will let the client, assuming there there's no injuries, there's no issues, I will let them fall to the floor. Um, not in an irresponsible way and not like face planting, but when the hips drop down, they're going to roll backwards. Okay. So we, we need the space. I'll give them 60 seconds rest for today's purposes. I'll give them the 60 seconds. The legs are already shot. The hip flexors, the quads are going to be shaky. I'm going to put them into a push up position. Um, depending on the strength of the individual, if they, if they can't do full push ups at a slow cadence, I will cut the range down. I'll do a couple of things. I'm either going to cut the range if they cannot do a full range of motion uh, chest to floor, all right, meaning they don't have the strength on the bottom end to, to push themselves back up because of the leverage. So what I'll do is I'll put them um, – I would bring a medicine ball, uh, and I would put that underneath their chest, and that would be their anchor point. So they might only be coming down to 90 degrees. I'll do that to failure. Uh, let's assume, again, it's somewhere between the 60 seconds to two minutes. I'll let them hit, hit, hit. I'll roll the ball out. Let's if they're in a, a full position, by the way, so it's not from the knees. Then what I'm going to have them do is I'm going to drop the knees down. So now they're going from a, a kneeling position push up, and I'm going to start working on a very slow negative chest to floor. Assuming they have the energy, we're going to push them back up, um, and then I'm going to bring them back down again until they're they're completely burnt out. So those would be the first two. We'll hook up and tether the TRX. That's going to be a very straightforward uh, pattern. Okay, so just you set your angle, make sure it's secure in the door. Um, I always, assuming the space was there, um, if you're using a TRX, you should shift it to the hinge because some of the doors that I've gone to in homes, it's flimsy, it's like hollow, and you can actually hear a little bit of a cracking going on. Uh, and I had one client whose door actually gave. Not broke, but not opening, just the actual door itself cracked. So Do you have to pay for that? Uh, no, because I gave the warning first. <laughs> <laughs> um, thankfully, there, you know, her husband was handy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I anchor it closer to the hinge because it's just, it's just a more solid position. But again, uh, you've got to make sure that you, you have the space to be able to do it. Um, so that one, I don't, I never really, uh, did anything fancy with that. That was just a straight to failure, uh, up and down. I may do a hold at the end if I know that they're on their last rep. So if, the, if you can get up on the concentric and you, I, and, and as, you know, as the trainer, you'll, you'll, you'll be pretty good at judging what your client's going to be able to do if there's going to be a next rep kind of coming out of them or not. Um, and that'll be, that'll sometimes just come with time working with the same person if that makes sense. Um, you'll just know their nuances and, you know, some people just drop straight. Like they, they look like they've got tons of energy and then die. And then you've got other people that are just grinding out rep after rep, even though you think they should have been done three reps earlier. So what I will do is I'll have them just kind of hold, uh, at the, at the contracted, uh, position for, you know, let's say 10 seconds, 15 seconds until I really see them shaking. And then I'll let them do an extra slow negative and then we'll, we'll call it there. So that would be the first three. Um, I'll do some kind of shoulder work. Uh, that at that point, I would give them. Uh, I would use the power block dumbbells. Um, the problem for a lot of the clients that I would see was they didn't have any kind of bench. There was no back support. So, which can be good. Uh, again, it depends on how you're cueing it. So, I'd have them sit uh, ideally on a on a table where their hips are at 90 degrees, or a chair. Um, I would stabilize them uh, with my hand pulling the rib cage down. So, what ends up happening a lot. Um, you know, you can see this, Lawrence, but obviously nobody else can. But you're going to see people kind of arch up thoracically, so they're going to they're going to really wind back, and the rib cage is really going to elevate to the point where, depending on the mobility in the shoulders, what they're really trying to do is get the uh, the kind of the clavicular uh, the clavicular sorry fibers of the pec involved. So it's almost like an incline press. So what I do is I pull the rib cage down, I set their position first, then hand them the weights, and then it'll be the same thing. It'll be a ten ten. 
sometimes sub failure, uh, mainly because with free weights, I'm not too comfortable uh, having buddy, uh, having people push to the very, very limits. Um, so what I'll do is on the rep, they'll come to the extension at the top. As I have them come down, we're going to hold it at 90 degrees right there, and I'll hold that to time until they just can't support the weight, and then we'll bring it down. Quick question on that. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you could have your hands in precarious positions on the uh, client's body. So, any yeah. Ha- on ha- that? <laughs> hashtag me too. Um, uh, yeah. It, I, so. <sighs> It is. You have to have a rapport with the client, and, and and generally speaking, keeping in mind too, you're going to people's homes, so you you have to be a little more cautious. Um, I a lot of my clients were women, and I think as a general rule, I mean, from percentage wise, if I look back at the numbers, it was somewhere around seventy percent female. Um, and you're generally going to their homes when there's nobody else there. So there does have to be a little bit of an explanation uh, prior to the session, the first, at least at the first meeting, where you're explaining, look, I am at times going to have my hands on you in certain positions. This is to give you better body awareness, better positioning, to make sure you understand uh, you know, the, the muscles that we're trying to target are the ones that you're actually using. Um, and just give them the heads up. If they're not comfortable, they're going to tell you. Um, knock on wood, I've never had an issue with it. But yeah, it is, it is definitely something you want to pay attention to. Okay, cool. Sorry. So do you want to continue the workout? Yeah. So um, so we would do the shoulder press. The The one that I would end up leaving out a lot is obviously some kind of pulling exercise. Uh, sorry, uh, a horizontal pull, like a pull down. Because we don't, there's just, if, if you don't have the equipment, um, there's really not too, too much. What I would sometimes try to do is just lie them on the floor and work from like a pullover position. And I would do it. Uh, so basically, if I put a client on their back, I'd extend their arms behind them. Um, just like a straight arm pullover, maybe holding a dumbbell or what I would do is basically brace at the elbow and I would have them do statics, uh, at different angles throughout the range of motion. And I would do it that way. It, it's, you know, probably not ideal. Uh, I don't have a problem with, uh, with isometrics or anything like that. It's just, um, you know, from a flow perspective with the workout, I would prefer if the first exercise is going to be, you know, full range, uh, I just like keeping everything kind of together, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm just thinking one way you could get around that is um, you could use, you could do what Doug did in a, uh, he put, he did a YouTube video on this where he used, he sat at a table and he got yeah. some yoga blocks out and he basically drove his elbows into elbows the yoga in. blocks in a time static contraction, um, yep. which, you know, is a, is another alternative way you could, uh, an alternative to, to a chin up, I suppose, to an extent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, a hundred percent, and that would that would work fine. And and like I said, so you can play it that way. Um, there's not necessarily if you if you have the basic mechanics of what your lats are doing, because that's essentially what you're trying to target. Then then really the sky's the limit in terms of what you're doing. Again, just making sure it's safe and you're not putting the client in a precarious position where you're you're going to set them up for injury. So you don't want an extreme range of motion either, obviously. And now it's time for a quick break. This episode is brought to you by Health IQ, a life insurance company that helps health conscious people like runners cyclists, weightlifters, high intensity training participants and more get a lower rate on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com forward slash warrior to support the show and see if you qualify. If you take care of yourself, you do smart strength training, you eat well and your life insurance company doesn't seem like they care, there's an answer for you. Health IQ actually gives savings to people who take care of themselves. About 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4 and 33% on their life insurance because of this to see if you qualify get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash c warrior or mention a promo code c warrior when you talk to a health iq agent and now back to the show i think it's um, it, you're, you're absolutely right and it is amazing like how much fatigue you can drive through some very very simple exercises like i'm as the listeners will know and as you probably know craig i've been doing sort of project kratos for quite a while now uh, yeah. from home which is a complete body weight workout um and I, c- I mean, there's an exercise uh, that Drew recommends. Uh, I'm sure Drew didn't probably come up with this, but that he recommends called um, it's the time static contraction simple row. And you're just lying on your back on a yoga mat, 
um, yeah. dro- you know, your, your elbows out parallel, um, so that you're in like a T shape and then driving your elbows into the floor. And I, yeah. I, I can't even do that for 30, 30, 30, cause I get fried. So I had to reduce it to like 30, 20, 10, cause I can't even be on, you know, those last 10 seconds, I can't even contract anymore cause I'm so fatigued. <laughs> and my girlfriend's looking at me like, what the hell are you doing? You're not even doing anything. I'm like, you try it. Like it's hard. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's brutal. And that's, and that's the thing. And I think people, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot, like if you have access to the, like you were mentioning, you, you trained a Keezer, right? If you have access to the equipment, it's great. I, I mean, you know, the sky's the limit. You have tons of options. Um, but I think we get very hung up on gear and it's like, I love shiny new things. I, I, you know, yeah, like I'll sit there online and just waste time looking at new equipment that's coming out for, for a host of reasons. It's not even stuff necessarily that I would ever use, but it's just the, ah, oh, that's cool, you know, kind of factor to it. But at the end of the day, you know, whether it's a push up, whether it's a static, I mean, you're fatiguing the muscles, you know? So unless you need specifically like a, you're a power lifter or you're an Olympic lifter where your sport happens to involve the need for that equipment, you can do a ton. I mean, there's nothing you can't do with just body weight. And, you know, you can throw the TRX in there if you want, but even that is not, you know, you don't really need it. It makes things a little easier. You know, it gives you more options, but, you know, I think sometimes not having the access to all this stuff makes you more creative, makes you think your way through the problems a little bit more. And at the end of the day, I think would probably give you more benefit just because you're, you're coming up with new ways of doing things. And I am, I, I, I think uh, when you had John Little on, he had mentioned this, this idea that the body can become really efficient doing the same thing over and over. Cause he was, you know, he was mentioning maybe changing up the program more frequently. And I have noticed for myself, I get better results if I change on about a four to six week cycle. And again, I think it's simply because I'll, I'll see my strength go up. That's, that, that's not the issue. Um, but I don't get that same pump. I don't get that same sensation. If I vary, and it could be something like just as simple as varying an angle, you know, like you're talking about putting the elbows horizontal, move the elbows down a bit. And, and that's going to change the dynamic of the exercise. You know, so something that simple, which doesn't seem like a big thing, is a huge thing. I remember when I used to do the Poliquin seminars and all that, they, they would talk about changing your hand position. You know, going from a fat bar to a narrow bar. Uh, little things like that would just change, make slight changes in the recruitment patterns, and it's a new exercise. So. Yeah. Yeah, that is really interesting. The subtleties you can make to to change your program and, and the effectiveness of it. Um, okay, so going back to you were describing the workout, you got to you kind of explaining how you don't normally have a uh, a chin up exercise in there, or that you may try and use some sort of yeah. like isometric pullover movement. Um, is there anything after that? Of- uh, it, would de- it would depend on the client. So what I would try to do, um, because usually you can get through that pretty quick, right? So you're done even with a little bit of talking in between and things like that. Um, let's let's assume 20 minutes. Um, I would always look at whatever area they're lacking in terms of their mobility, and I would spend some time at the end just playing around with that. And it might be something as simple as just doing like a yoga cat stretch. Um, it could be something as simple as doing sort of an Agoscu, um, method, uh, hold against, you know, legs up against the wall for five minutes. Um, it would depend on the client, but that's usually how I try to finish things up. Uh, and we would go and go that route. Um, if they had access to some kind of cardio machine, then I would throw in like a, a high intensity interval training, uh, you know, a basic Tabata or, or a variation on there. Cool. And we'd go there. We do like that. And typically your clients, you train them sort of twice a week from home. Is that, is the, that typical Kate, a sort of frequency? Uh, yeah. So it was actually – so when I transitioned, because I had people that were doing two to three times a week. Uh, some were doing four times a week. Um, so it could – yeah, I would say more or less at that time, it was about tw- two sessions per week. I had clients doing once just because of scheduling uh, and travel. Uh, they, you know, to, to, to try to commit to twice a week wasn't realistic. So, um, and they were all doing well. It's a little harder to gauge, right? Like you, you're doing the body weight stuff. It's, it's harder to see the progress. You know, if, if we move a pin up or down, sorry, uh, you know, look, you, you know, I'm doing better. Like you, you have a, an easy to follow metric, um, with body weight, it's a little harder because, you know, I can go, so let's, let's take the push up for an example. I can go and touch the floor with my chest. Um, and there's my range. And then as I start to fatigue, you know, the client's wearing a loose fitting shirt. I don't have a gauge. And certainly if it's a female, I'm not putting my hands underneath there to see how low they're going. Um, 
So, you know, maybe they're, they're stopping an inch shorter, you know, so their time is going up, but they, they've, they've truncated that range of motion a little bit and they're not doing the same, you know, you know, they're losing a few degrees and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you're trying to figure out if you want to progress to a different position, so maybe uh, a regular width push up and moving the hands in a little bit more, uh, which is a little more challenging for most people, I, you know, you can't quite judge it the same way as, as, as you can on a, on a, a machine based exercise or using dumbbells or, or whatever. So that, that, that would be a bit more of an issue, but. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking like, obviously, like, as you were just describing there, a progression system is a lot more complex versus, say, if you're training someone on a resistance training machine where you're just literally increasing the poundage uh, week on week. Um, yeah. So I guess, I mean, you might have some thoughts on this. I would just, just say that uh, Drew Bay's Project Creators is a good, I think, a great resource for anyone who's thinking about starting some sort of in-home um you know, resistance training business, um, because in there he's got, you know, a progression system that you can learn and then apply on your clients. And you can, st- you know, if they're a, new, uh, a real beginner, for example, you could have them down at the lowest level and then sort of progress them through. But have you got any thoughts on how you, how people might want to progress with their clients? Yeah, for sure. I, I well, first of all, I think yeah, I, I like I haven't read Project Kratos, um, but I mean that was that book is written specifically for high intensity strength training. So I, I think first and foremost, that would be the one that uh, without reading it, that would be the one I would recommend because I think True's track record is such that you know what you're going to get from him, uh, and you know it's quality, and you know it's going to be you know there's a lot of time put into it. So that would be the first one. You could also look at um, from a progression standpoint anything done by the uh, Cavaldo brothers. So Alan, Danny. Uh, Cavaldo, um, they've got so they're part of uh, was it Progressive Calisthenics through uh, Dragon Door Publications. Um, so they've done they do a bunch of seminars. They've got books and everything. They've got some cool stuff in there. Um, you could take their progressions and modify it to hit. Um, I don't think there there's a lot more tricks, right? So you've got like human flags, and you've got which is great if you have a goal to do all that stuff, then fantastic. But even if you don't, there's there's a lot of things in there you can learn. Um, I'm a big believer when you're buying uh, books, if you come out of it with one piece of information, it's worth it. You know, so you can argue, yeah, but it's like forty dollars. Well, okay, it's forty bucks, but if you know, if if it gets that one client over the hump then you know you know it's great it's it's money well spent so um i'd look at their stuff as well um the other one which i loved was uh was convict conditioning um you know the book you know a lot of people say that it's bs in terms of the guy that wrote it that he was not you know that he doesn't exist and there was no you know prison terms or whatever but it doesn't take away from from the content and and the progressions there are pretty easy to follow and that's very much zero equipment right like you know the the idea is to be in the what is an eight by twelve cell or whatever it is so so I, I would look at that one as well in terms of uh, in terms of what you could do in, uh, for progressions, and then decide what you want to do. If it's just body weight, then you don't need equipment. Um, I would always recommend having the option because you never know what you're going to encounter when you go. And maybe having some tubing or maybe having a TRX, maybe having some dumbbells is going to help. Um, and that'll actually I'll just bring that in because with the in home, and I don't know if you you want to talk about this now, but. You, it's like any business you need to know what your market is and where you're yeah. and who you're tar- yeah so so who you're going to target because I, I think when i sent you the email one of the things i said was you could theoretically go after seniors residences right um and i don't know what it's like out there out here it's it's they're prominent um and they're pretty high end i'm assuming you know ireland would be the same way uh, they, definitely they, they exist in most i'd say economically developed you know countries yeah yeah. So, so like out here as an example, so not far from my place, uh, you, you know, you've got places where they're spending five thousand dollars, you know, a month on their, and these are autonomous uh, facilities. There, there are cafeterias and everything. They have like full calves in there, but these are, you know, there are people that are living in these uh, places that, you know, can they go shopping? They're not, uh, they don't need help. They, you know, they're let's say sixty five years old, and they love the community. So, if you're going to target something like that, you have access most likely to a gym. Because they probably have one in the facility, you don't have to use it, but it's just to give you the idea that 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 option is there. Um, but if they are older and they haven't got the experience uh, of of exercise, it's far easier to use a tool like uh, maybe a TRX, but definitely tubing, definitely dumbbells to get them started because they might not be comfortable uh, doing bodyweight squats or they might not be comfortable doing any kind of push up on the floor. Maybe they can't get down on the floor properly or maybe they can't get up off the floor properly. Right. So those are all the little things you want to consider. But um, 
like one of the issues I had when I was doing it, and most of my clientele were more executive-ish types or house moms, stuff like that, but they, they had a high income. Um, so even though like with the house moms, time was still a factor because they had kids. They were running, you know, they're running around for different things, foundations, whatever. Their time was still valuable. It wasn't like they just sat at home and, and you know, did nothing. Like, so they, you know, it was no different than working with a CEO in, in that regard. But one of the issues, and I'll, I'm kind of jumping around a bit, so just bear with me, but um, the travel time is going to be an issue. So if you're doing 30 minute sessions, you're not going to be wanting to, dr- you don't want to drive 20 minutes from point A to point B, and then another 20 minutes from point A to point, you know, from point B to point C, because you're wasting, like you've got, if you're doing a 30 minute session, well, that driving just took you 40 minutes. So now you've lost a session in that, right? Um, you can account for it in your billing, but it is problematic because everybody's got a limit, right? Um, depending on your area, uh, not everybody's going to pay premium dollar for your windshield time. So your driving time. So you got to consider that. What I didn't do very well, and I would really recommend this to anybody considering any type of in-home business, is pick your area and stick to it. Because what's going to happen is referrals are always going to be huge, but you're going to get people saying, hey, I've got an aunt, I've got a brother, I've got a friend. They're going to live further and further outside, and that's going to keep expanding. And what ended up happening with me was I would end up driving you know, in a day sometimes, 60, 70 kilometers uh to to you know to go cl- to clients homes but some of them were just on the outskirts of where i needed to be so i would be driving 25 minutes to get to one to drive 25 minutes to get back to where i was so the scheduling was completely you know it was just useless and the pr- the other issue that you're going to have is cuz i tried this and it didn't work that well is you're working off your client's time your clients you can be firm about it to a certain degree but if they have appointments and the only day they can train on is on a tuesday but you have a client that happens to live down the street from them that you see on monday it doesn't mean that you can just force one to switch times to the other do you understand what i mean yeah if that makes sense yeah so so there's a lot of little things to factor in um but the biggest ones like i said so figure out your area um ideally it's got to be affluent um, you know, because you want people that have the money to pay for the service. They're the drawback, and I would love uh, actually if you ever if you have Luke Carlson on again, I'd love to hear his take on it. Um, because I have a lot of high end uh, executives, but the same people that can afford to pay me are the same people that can afford to take three weeks vacation at a time, right? And I have yet to figure out a way to bill people for not being there. <laughs> um. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, Full that's, time. yeah, well, that's, it, it, I think monthly is probably the, the best way to go. And, and with them understanding that they're reserving their slots, because I'm at a point now uh, with the gym where I'm getting everybody wanting the same times. Because uh, you're, you're always going to see the same thing, right? If you go after the executive types, it's first thing in the morning, maybe end of day or maybe lunch. That, that's what I see. But when you have everybody fighting for, I want Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I want Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, uh, but you've got guys that are taking off, okay, I'm going to – so out here, uh, my weather sucks, right? Um, we've – from about December the 9th to present, we've had uh, – most days are hitting like minus 25, minus 30 degrees Celsius, uh, wind chills at minus 36. Um, it's cold. Like yesterday was plus 2. Uh, today's minus uh, – I woke up this morning, I think it was minus 14. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so everybody takes off to Florida. That's what my clients all do. I'm going to, they've got places in Florida. They take off. Um, oddly enough, one of them, uh, was, I, I sent him off to, uh, Dave Landau. So he, uh, he was training with Dave while he was there. Um, so those are the issues. Those are the things that you contend with and you have to figure out, um, for you, uh, how that's going to work. Right. Cool. Okay. That's a good points there. Um, you know, keep your your area small um and affluent as you say because yeah all this travel time can really take away from the efficiency of the of that type of business um yeah and and a couple of things i wanted to cover i mean you've already covered this to an extent already um targeting kind of the older population um you, it sounds like from what you you email me um that you actually prefer to work with kind of older clientele who don't work out uh, or haven't got kind of a background in exercise why is that 
Um, okay, so I'll I'll backtrack a little bit. When I when I started doing the personal training, um, like everybody else, especially out here, uh, like my big goal was athletes. Like I wanted to work with you know pro hockey players and things like that. Um, and I got a couple of guys that I was training that were in the NHL draft, and it was a lot of fun to work with them. But athletes, in in my experience, specifically in these sports, so I don't, I don't want to generalize, but the people I worked with were somewhat, um, not lazy, but flighty, I guess, you know, like, well, my buddy's doing this program. How come I'm not training this way? And it was a constant, like, okay, look, I want you to do this. I don't want you to do that. Here's why. And, and, and I kind of got tired of just explaining myself over and over to the point where it was, it was almost like, you know what? Fuck you. Like, this is what you're doing. Like, stop asking me questions. Um, you're paying for my, you know, apparently you're paying me for my expertise. Let me, let me do my thing. Um, and it wasn't all that full. Like I, I got into this to help people. I think everybody that does the training wants to help people. Right. Um, I hope, <laughs> I hope it's just not a money thing. Cause you're going to be, you know, a lot of people are going to be disappointed if that's why, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that, you know, I wanted to help people and I, I started working with, um, you know, I'd get different things. I'd get people with uh, a bit of Parkinson's and I'd get people, I had, I did work with uh, somebody briefly with MS and, and just getting them to, to move a little better or to, you know, to be able to stand a little longer at the table or at the chair or get out to move, to walk around the block. It, it's a hugely rewarding feeling because, you, you know, you kind of feel like you're part of that. You're part of their progress. You know, you're providing the tools, they're doing the work, but it's because of what you're, you're helping them with that they're getting there. You know, if that makes sense, I, you know, I like, I take the failures of my clients as well as the, um, as well as their successes. If my clients aren't doing well, I'm, I feel like I'm letting them down somehow. Like I'm not either, I'm not explaining what they need to be doing or I'm not, uh, maybe adjusting the program uh, efficiently to to get them or effectively to get them to you know to where they want to go you know so so I'll take that as well and I found that with the people that you know had different disorders that were you know that just wanted to be able to have a better quality of life they were really appreciative of what you were doing and and I, I think that drives like for me personally that drives me to want to learn more. Um, there were points uh, I kind of go up and down in the industry in terms of there's days where, you know, like I'll, I'll listen to the arguments between volume and hit and, and, and all this stuff. And I, and I just sort of, I, like, all I hear is like, ah, blah, 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 blah. Um, I would rather look at what we have in common versus what we have different, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, so, so, you know, there were part, there were points in time where I was just fed up with the industry as a whole. Like everything to me was a sales pitch. Everything was buy my book, come to my seminar. And, and I stopped going, like I stopped doing seminars. I stopped buying books. I was just, I, I, had, I had done it. And it's not because I felt like I knew more than anybody else. It wasn't that at all, but it was just sort of, uh, I, I'd had enough. And then getting more and more into, involved with these people, um, it, it was just rewarding. It was great. And then all of a sudden I'm reading again and I'm, I'm, I'm searching out different, uh, I won't call them mentors, but just different, you know, gurus, if you want to call them that, uh, to read more and to learn more. And it wasn't necessarily just in hit, it was in everything, but, uh, yeah, it just, it kind of re sparked my, my interest in the field. So how does, how does someone get started? I mean, you know, you had, you were an instructor, you had some clients already, so you could kind of transition them into that model, but how does someone start who has, hasn't got that foundation? Um, okay. So are you talking somebody that's, that's certified already or somebody that's in the well, business or they just want to jump? Let's start even further back. So how do they actually get certified in something like this and then go uh, from, and then build actual business? Okay. So, um, I think, well, look, I think if you want to do, if your focus is going to be hit, then, you know, let's, let's plug your sponsor here. Um, and, and hit unis is great. When, uh, when I was working at progressive, uh, hit in Montreal, the office manager actually was doing in the process of doing that certification. I don't know if she ever, um, if she ever finished it, but, uh, and I didn't get to look at it that closely when she was doing it, but it seemed very, um, comprehensive, uh, I thought. So I, I would probably go that route. 
just because that's ultimately what you're going to want to be doing, right? You want to, if you want to work in high intensity strength training, this is a great way of doing it. Um, the second thing I would start to do is, is, is start reading up everything you can, like book after book after book, watch YouTube, uh, you know, find Drew's talks, find Skylar's talks, find Dr. McGuff's talks and start and, and listen to it over and over. Cause you, each time you're going to pick up stuff. And then I think the most important thing is, is you may have to suck it up for a little bit and get yourself in a gym. Uh, as an instructor and it is going to drive you up a wall like if you know i i I, i'm thankfully like i've got my own place i don't have to set foot in these big box gyms and and just you know i'm i'm bald but like you know proverbially pulling out the hair uh and looking at some of the dumb stuff that people do and there's a shitload of dumb stuff that people do in a gym for and, and it's not under and like i'll stress that Sometimes people are doing exercises in in a very specific context for a very specific reason. So I don't want to say that there's stuff. There's certainly things out there that I wouldn't do, but I understand why somebody's doing it. I'm specifically talking about just people doing stuff that just has no rhyme or reason for any purpose. You know, it's dangerous. It's 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 useless, and you know, ultimately they're going to get themselves hurt. But um, you you realistically want to work with as many people as possible to get the experience, both in the interaction from a personal level, but also looking at the nuances and differences in terms of, of the behavior uh, that people will display during an exercise uh, during any exercise, because we're all going to be a little bit different. Um, and you know, over time, you're going to pick up on ways of quickly, you know, your workarounds, if you will, for the person. Um, if that, I'm not sure if that actually made any sense, but. Um, Okay. Yeah. So, so that would be the first thing. And, and maybe like, I'm not saying do it for three, four years because the pay is going to suck. You don't get paid well. Um, I'm assuming it still works on the same premise of you have to do your floor hours, uh, which for most gyms is probably about eight hours a week on the floor at whatever the minimum wage is in whatever city you're working in. Um, but it'll give you the opportunity to maybe get a couple of, uh, clients and then you can start building from there. Uh, and that's how, I mean, that's how I did it. So I worked on the floor, got my first couple of clients. I've been incredibly fortunate on my retention rate. Uh, I've had clients that started with me back in like 98 that I still see or 97 actually that I, that I still see today. So, you know, we're talking to, like basically 20 years. Before, uh, no, that's amazing. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. Um, before, uh, <laughs> before i ask you that question i didn't even think of that uh, as in like this is how that's my mind works it's like i don't think of these simplest solutions sometimes it's like yeah you just go and become a personal trainer at a gym for a couple of years duh like that's the obvious well, way it was one way well, it's, you know it's it's one way i mean look if you if you're fortunate enough to you know have access to somebody uh like that could actually mentor you that you could go work for directly Directly, and, and maybe it's free. You're volunteering your time um, to work with them. It's it's money well spent, or or yeah, well, money well spent because you're not getting paid. But but you're going to learn a ton. Um, like yeah, like I'll give you an example. Like the the Poliquin seminars that I did back in the late '90s. Like I felt like I got more out of that than I ever got out of any school. Um, and 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 I, I will stress for anybody that's seen him live, the guys, he, whether or not you agree with his his um, his style of training, the guy's brilliant. And you know, I learned a ton. Now, do I use it all? No, but it's still there, right? Um, and that was at the time, I think, uh, for a two day seminar, I think I paid about six hundred dollars in nineteen ninety seven. And I would to this day say that I learned more than that than I would have learned in a in a university level course. Um, so that's the other thing you want to do is is just immerse yourself in, in in the field and definitely look at other um, uh, other modalities. It doesn't have to be hit. Um, because you're still going to be able to get stuff out of there that you can apply to hit. If you know what I mean, like, like I go back and forth. So I'm, I don't call myself a hit guy. Like I don't, I try not to push myself to one camp or another. Like I'll call myself a strength guy. So I, I teach my clients strength training and I will, I mean, I definitely start everybody on hit. I do have clients that will transition from hit to more of a, a, a higher volume approach and then back to, to pure hit again. So I'll kind of cycle in and out of that. Um, and then I have some people that come to me specifically once a week. They don't, they have no interest in working out more than that. And if they don't see me, they're not working out. So in 52 weeks, they're going to do 48 sessions and that's it. And that is pure hit. Cause if you're coming once a week, there's, you don't have another option in my opinion. There's no other program out there that will deliver you the results, um, versus hit on, on a once a week, uh, protocol. 
Absolutely. Okay, yeah. let, let's talk about um, money and revenue and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, people, are, I mean, I, I'm skeptical, but I'm, I'm sure listeners are also skeptical about, you know, how can you really make this a profitable business that you can do full time uh, and make a reasonable living? So do you want to just talk about that? How you, you know, sort of charging model that you that you use to kind of optimize all of that? Yeah, for sure. Um, look, it's a tough business. Um, a lot of the guys that I started with and girls um, that I started with uh, in in '97 aren't doing this anymore. Um, they've, you know, uh, fortunately for them, they've, you know, found other jobs, more secure jobs, and things like that. Um, what what I would suggest if you want to do this, and I I think this could probably go for any business, but. Um, the first thing I would say is make sure you have your own personal finances in order because um, – and this is – so I've got like – I was mentioning this earlier to you, Lawrence, before we, we started recording, but I've got three kids. I've got a mortgage. I've got a car. Um, I've got a wife. Um, so I have personal financial responsibilities that I have to meet. And what I've found over the years is that sometimes my decision making in terms of my business is going is skewed or influenced by what I need personally, right? So if I see like all of a sudden I've got a ton of bills coming in for different things on the house or whatever, it's going to affect my decision making on what I try to do in the business. And sometimes it ends up being um, a bad short term decision, sorry, a bad long term decision made in the short term to help me out. Uh, on the personal end, if that makes sense. Um, so make sure your personal finances are in order. That's the first thing. The second thing is, yeah, you're doing in home, so your cost is going to be a lot less. Um, but don't go into debt trying to start the business. I'm not a big believer in that because um, I, I don't believe that you ever want to be um, locked into anybody for anything. I think if you can do it on your own, do it on your own. Um, uh, I learned that actually, uh, I'll kind of segue here a little bit, but, uh, when I was with progressive hit downtown, there was an outside investor that was pumping in a lot of money. Um, and I won't go into the details. It, unfortunately the gym didn't work out, but it was, it was a little bit out of hand because I think, you know, people talk about this all the time in, in the tech world, right? You just get outside, uh, you know, angel, angel money and all that. Uh, um, there's a point where the business wasn't making money and this guy is forking it out left and right. And you're feeling comfortable because it's not your money. Like you've got no skin in the game in that regard. Like, yeah, like for me, you know, the gym closed, uh, you know, they owed me money at the end of it, but I came back and I had my other space and, and all was good in the world. But, um, what I learned from it was that as soon as you had somebody else invested in, in what you're doing, and I wasn't an owner in the company, I'll just I'll stress that now. I wasn't uh, I didn't have any money in the company. But as soon as somebody else is, is is putting in that cash, they have an influence on the decision, right? So there are certain things, as an example, um, you know, that I wanted to do downtown at that facility because I was I was supposed to be the guy uh, that they didn't. They just kind of blew off. They're like, no, we're doing it this way. And I failed on my end trying to explain to them, you know, the whys, the reasoning why I thought this would be a better option than what they had planned. And they didn't, they didn't hear it. And like I said, I, you know, to this day, I'll say that I didn't, I obviously just didn't explain myself enough. Maybe they wouldn't have listened. I don't know, but I think I could have done harder there. But anyway, so that's the first thing. Don't borrow the money. Figure out how to fund it on your own. If you're doing in homes, you don't need a lot of equipment. So 200 bucks will get you, you know, tubes, a TRX, and maybe some late dumbbells if you need it. Uh, that would be the first thing um, that I would really pay attention to. The second thing is it is always easier, going back to what I mentioned about wife and kids and family, if you're not in a in, in a family setting. If you're transitioning, I'll, I'll, I'll address that in a second. But like from a job with a family and, and wanting to get into this, we can talk about that as well. But um, the less baggage, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, because God forbid my wife is listening and you're calling us baggage. <laughs> but uh, um, but it, like I said, it, it just it keeps your mind a little clear on terms of what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish. And it makes it easier to navigate. Um, I noticed uh, when you had Luke on the last time, you would ask him if he was in a relationship, right? And his answer was no. And I think like looking at what he's trying to accomplish, um, and, and maybe this sounds cold or whatever, but I think that's ideal. Because he's not – like he can focus 100% on the business and not worry about the distractions of, of, of the other stuff. And, me, and I, I've never spoken to the man, so I'm just you – know, from the outside looking in, that's, that would be my interpretation. Um, and, 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 and I think that's great. Um, now, 
if you're in a relationship, if you have a family and like you know, you were asking, you're trying to transition out of one job uh, to to get into training, you want to do this as 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 your you know your calling if you want to call it that, um, then I would go back to the gym. I would do that part time and maintain the job you have. Like God for like, do not drop it. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't quit your job and go jumping headfirst into this, unless you've got a good nest egg that'll support you for a while while you build it up. Um, so that would be, but that would be my first advice. And then you know you need the referrals, you need the network. So that goes back to the you know going to the seminars, meeting these people that are presenting, um, meeting like minded people, trainers. And I would suggest, if you can, is is to try to get in with like physiotherapists and athletic therapists and things like that, and really understand, uh, especially if it's hit, is understand what your pitch is going to be to them. Because ideally, you, if you can re, um, if you can form a relationship with a physio or an athletic therapist, or, or or ideally like a clinic where you're referring your clients to them, they can cross refer to you. You know, you're set. You've got you've got a nice steady stream of business, and it, but it has to be mutual. Um, I think a lot of times what I see is, you know, the trainer's always wanting from the clinics and from the physios and from everybody, you know, bring me clients, bring my clients, but the trainer's not really doing anything to reciprocate the, you know, the, the relationship. So um, that's that would be one of the first things actually I would look at. Uh, and that goes in, like in my case, when I was working with uh, older populations, I did know. Uh, fortunately, I did have access to, to different therapists and things like that that I could uh, I could go to for for those referrals. But your pitch with HIT, uh, you have to fit it into you know who you're talking to as well. So for the the physios and the orthopedics, you know, especially the orthopedics, like the big thing is you're not going to hurt the client, right? You're not going to hurt his patient or her patient, um, which is like paramount. Um, and when I've spoken with orthopedics in the past, that's one of the first things they've said to me is, you know, don't break what I've done, um, which is which is huge, right? So that's you know, I would go that route. It's kind of ironic, though, isn't it? A little bit. <laughs> what, yeah, <laughs> just, just a wee bit. But it's yeah, um, but yeah, that's that's how I would do it. I, I would I would look. I think for for as a general rule, if you can get into a gym. Put in your floor hours. It's a pain in the ass. Like I said, it's not. It doesn't pay well, but the experience is priceless. A ton of seminars. It doesn't have to be hit, but just get yourself kind of immersed into the industry as a whole. As you know, screwed up as the industry is, and it's massively there's problems everywhere with it. Um, and that's a completely different conversation. But um, immerse yourself in it. Learn as much as you can. Um, and always with an open mind. Um, it doesn't matter. Like I said, it doesn't matter what you what you might think of of the presenter, what you might think of the material. But if you can draw one thing out of it, great. You, you've learned something, and you might learn what not to do. Okay, the, 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 there's the other thing there. I, I love this because this is yeah. I mean, it's it's like look, if this is what you want to do, this is if you really care about helping people and training people. And we can talk about the the commercial aspect in a minute. Um, yeah. Just take it one step at a time. Just don't because I think if you try and eat the elephant, you're just going to be like, oh, there's no way. Like I've got this family to support. I've got this full-time job. If you just go, okay, first step, get qualified, you know, do a hit uni course. Sorry for the second plug guys. Um, <laughs> and then, or, or like, you know, okay, I'm going to go and work for this guy, you know, two nights a week or whatever it is at his personal training or her personal training studio and learn from them, invest in, in me. I'm kind of talking from the third person now. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, and get this person as a mentor and just take it one step at a time. And I think people often look at the, the whole thing and think, oh, it's too, it's too much. Um, sorry, I went off on a tangent there, but yeah, I wanted to, uh, just talk to you about pricing for a moment. Um, so yeah. what, how much, you know, what does someone charge for a service like this? Uh, I, I don't know that I can give you a, a, a real amount because I think it's going to depend on the location in the area. Um, so, well, I'll give, here, I'll give you an example. Um, so Blair Wilson, uh, my brother trains with Blair in Toronto and, um, I, and I, I, I don't, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure of the pricing, but I think he's somewhere around 75 a session, right? I can 100% guarantee you that I in no way could ever charge $75 a session in Montreal. Um, it's just two different cities. Um, even if, even in the downtown core, it's just a very different mentality. Um, the money in Toronto is far and above what you see in Montreal in terms of overall income. Okay. Uh, per, you know, per capita. Um, so it's going to fluctuate. So I think the first thing you would probably want to do is look at what the averages are in your area. You have to charge more than what the gym is charging. Okay. So if you have a big box gym in your area, 
go see what their their personal training packages are and understand that your client so if it, we'll just use round numbers okay um so let's say it's fifty dollars for a session uh at your big box gym first look is the session an hour is this is it is it a set block of time be, and usually it is because that's the standard model for training is going to be uh, your, your time for money right so whether it's 30 minutes or an hour your what the client is basically going to be paying for is is for that is for that time frame so if it's fifty dollars an hour um let's assume right off the bat that let's call it thirty dollars for 30 minutes uh you know so a dollar a minute at the gym if you're going to do it at home, the client's going to pay for the convenience of you going to them. Now we're going to up the price. Uh, what that what that percentage is going to be is probably going to depend on what your experience is as a coach and a trainer, what you're bringing to the table, first and foremost. And and then sort of, again, it's going to be the location. But I would suggest probably going, and, and, and again, I'm just throwing the number out here, but I was doing it around 10 to $15 over uh, what I saw in any gym. Uh, and it was closer to, actually, it was 15 Fifteen dollars over. Um, again, factoring in a couple of things, and you could. And again, this is an experience thing. So the the, the more you get into it, the, the higher your rates are going to go. And I always did climb the rates uh, on a yearly basis, um, not more than that. Um, but factoring in the vehicle that you're driving, if you're doing in home, um, don't like. I drove. Uh, I had a 2013 Jeep Wrangler Sahara Unlimited, so a four door, you know, with the roof that comes off and everything. I jacked it up. I put big tires on it. Um, I was paying $500 a month in gas. Okay. It, it just dumb on every single level from a business perspective. It's wasted money. And, and I, you know, people are like, yeah, but you can write it off. Yeah, I can write it off. It's still coming out of my pocket. So it's, it's irrelevant. It's still money I'm, I'm wasting. So buy a car that A, that's you can, you can easily afford, but B is, is going to be frugal. Uh, to get you around it. You don't need, uh, like, I get the idea of, of advertising on the vehicle and, and having, like, the cool factor stands out. But at the end of the day, you've got to drive it. So, um, and you're going to run, like, the stop and start of in-home training does does do a, a toll on, on the vehicle that you choose, right? So, so keep that in mind. Um, I blew out a, a car I had, uh, I blew out the back suspension from carrying kettlebells and dumbbells and everything else. I had about 400 pounds of weight on the back end of a Ford Focus wagon, and it blew it right. <laughs> like, it, it, it destroyed it um so so that's something you would want to you want to look at as well so you're pricing 15 bucks above uh as a starting point i think would be ideal and then if you if you are having to travel on a distance you can either try to factor that into the pricing so the client doesn't see it and then it's a non-starter in terms of they like they're done a non-starter but it's it, it doesn't become a conversation point or a, or a point of contention with the client when you're saying okay it's you know let's say 45 or 50 dollars for the session plus 10 dollars travel if that's what you're going to do i would just put the 10 dollar travel into the price and call it uh, you know 55 or whatever uh, and I, I would do it that way um if going back to what i was saying you you go outside outside of your your selected zone at that point then maybe you're you're adding a you're adding a fee and telling and basically making the client uh, trying to relay to the client that you're going out of your way to get to them. Um, not that you want to make it sound like you're doing them a favor because I don't think that goes over well, but but that you know the the time factor for you to do it has to be has to be factored in. Hmm. Do you know what? I just did some numbers there, um, just on the computer quickly while you were talking, just to figure out, just to figure out, like actually, you know, how much revenue you can expect to make if you're successful at this in a month, and it's yeah. quite good actually. It's like you know, Listen. if you're doing fifty dollars a session and you do, like you said sixty in your email, but even if you did half that, you're making fifteen hundred yeah. dollars a week. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Hey, listen, you can pull in good, good money. The the big issue, and I think any any trainer will will kind of. Uh, I, I think I get the impression Luke has figured this out, um, but most trainers will tell you the biggest problem is 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 keeping consistent with your your cash flow, which is why the the, the monthly pay model works so well now. Um, so out here we've got this gym. Well, it's a North American chain uh, franchise called Orange Theory Fitness, which is. Uh, more of a cardio kind of interval style training. It's not really not really geared for strength, but they do a monthly model whereby you know X number of sessions a week costs you this, or or I think it's a, or it may, might be just so many sessions per month. But you you're expected to do those sessions, and if you don't do them, you know there's no carryover the next month, which I think is a great way of doing it. I think, and that's sort of the way I've been kind of moving my price structure, um, because it's the, the problem is is like uh, I mentioned it earlier. 
if you have clients that can afford the services, those are the same people that can afford the vacations and to not be in town. And, you know, that's the conversation that has to be had at day one, right? You don't, the, the big mistake I think I made uh, when I was doing the in-home was the price structure wasn't necessarily, like I had it set, but I would make these changes and modifications as I saw, you know, the problems arise. Cause I kind of jumped into it without necessarily working on all the, all, all the details and all the things that could have gone wrong. So I was course correcting a lot as I went. And unfortunately, once you got somebody in a pay structure to transition them out, to, to your new way of doing things becomes a little bit problematic, especially if they feel like they're, you know, they're going to be paying more or whatever. Um, you know, sometimes it's not a problem, but, but it can be. So, so really kind of look at all that ahead of time and then just, you know, go into it and, and set it uh, right off the bat. Because like to your point, the 1500 a week is great, but you can see what you can see is like $1,500 one week or two weeks. And then all of a sudden it's 600 bucks. Right. Yeah. And that goes back. Yeah. And that's why I said, you know, make sure your personal finances and everything else are really in order because it's not necessarily going to be a stable income. Yeah. Especially at the beginning. Especially at the beginning. No, 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 no. Go. Yeah. It's no, I totally get your point. I think cash flow is, is clearly, uh, I can see that being a, a problem. Um, you know what? I, I, I'm not actually, I am actually doing a little bit of coaching for some people, okay. and, but I actually stopped taking on new clients recently because, um, <laughs> I got a bit of shiny object syndrome and, uh, <laughs> I realized Lawrence, you've got this podcast that's really taking off. Why aren't you just focusing on that? So I've actually, uh, decided not to take on any more. Um, and instead, I'm focused almost completely on the the podcast and, and growing that and, and the blog content because that's ultimately what I personally enjoy the most. Um, and there is obviously the the potential to to grow the revenue through that. Um, however, I did get into uh, I did start trying to learn about okay, what does it mean to become like a body transformation coach? Um, okay. And I came across um, some resources that are recommended by Gary actually, um, yeah. by a guy called Tim Drummond on how to become like an online personal trainer. Um, okay. And I'll link to his stuff because I think for anyone who's looking to learn about uh, being an online coach or um, becoming a personal trainer of any kind, it's it's a fantastic. Uh, he's got some fantastic materials, especially his ebook. Um, I will get to my point in a sec. And why I really found quite compelling about his approach is he was kind of he's kind of saying, look, you don't want to be a PT. PTs trade time for money. It doesn't scale very well. You want to get into online coaching where you're selling solutions. So you're not saying to someone, hey, I'm $50 an hour. You're saying, hey, I'm two grand, but this is what you're paying for an outcome. You're not paying for time. Yeah, um, exactly. And he was really smart at because I think that's totally fair. I think if someone invests that, they're much more likely to actually get the result because they've got skin in the game. And basically in his book, he describes how you go about doing that and pitching that and then delivering it successfully, like the whole thing, um, which is very compelling. And I think going back to your original point, you mentioned the four hour work week. There's a great ebook. So another resource called breaking the time barrier, which is basically the four hour yeah, work week. Okay. okay. So yeah, I think it is fresh books or one of those guys came up with it. It's an amazing yeah. book and it's a fantastic resource on how you can take the principles in a four hour work week and apply them to a service based business. The actual case study in the book is um, a web designer, but okay. it can be just as easy applied, I think, to um, personal training or online coaching, um, where instead of trying to sell hours, you're, you're selling an outcome. Um, so I don't know whether you've explored this or, or have any thoughts on that at all, Craig. Yeah, and I, it's it, it's funny you bring it up because it, it is something that I've been thinking about. And it's the idea that because and I think to your point about the skin in the game on the uh, on the part of the client, there's also more skin in the game for for the coach because you have a vested interest. You're, you're selling them for the results. You're not when it's uh, when you're doing the the per hour uh, model. There are days where you're almost going to feel like you're dialing it in, right? Like, yeah, here's a program. Do this, do this, do this, and you're just you're not there. You're not with it. Um, whereas when they're when they're paying for a package like that, where it's result oriented. They know what the end result, what they're, what they want with that end result. Um, you both easily have a very understandable goal to me. I think, I think it's great. I think it's a great way of doing it. Um, and then you put, you know, uh, I, now does he, does he recommend putting it on a time frame? Yeah, I think it's like twelve week or maybe a bit longer, depending on the client and their goals and what have you. But, yeah. Oh yeah, there would obviously be a, oh yeah, absolutely. It wouldn't be um, unending kind of, especially when they're paying yeah. a large sum of money. <laughs> so yeah, so so that would be the only, 
I, I guess that would be the only concern I would have is because everybody's a little different, right? So when you start doing these programs in terms of uh, – like, like I don't know if it's a set program that he's selling or if it's you know based on the person. Uh, which I would imagine if he's doing online coaching and it's kind of a bulk approach, I would imagine these are set programs that he's got a system behind to, 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 to sell to, right? Well, I mean, in terms of the oh, actual no. like protocol, programming, nutrition, coaching, all of that, I don't know what that looks like because I never got that far. Um, okay. But I imagine that you would standardize a lot in order to make it more efficient, especially when you're handling a, a, a large number of clients. Um, but I don't know, like... Uh, Sorry, I've forgotten the. What was the original? What was your original question? Well, so yeah, well, no, no, that's okay because you, 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 I was, I, what I, because I was trying to, I was trying to get to, to figure out because if if it's standardized, my concern would be. So let's say it's a twelve week. You, you know, sometimes depending on the client, you're going to get really good results, and you're going to get really poor results mm. uh, because. How do I word this? Um, physiologically, we're all the same, but we're all different. If if that makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go back and listen to this, by the way. And I've noticed I've said, like, <laughs> does that, this makes sense, right? I think I've said it like a hundred times <laughs> in the podcast. Um, but, and so my concern would be that person X is going to get, you know, 40 pounds of, of fat loss in the 12 weeks and they're going to be ripped and they're going to look fantastic. And then person Y, who's following the same, you know, the same approach, loses six pounds, even though they've done the exact same thing. And, but they're both paying the $2,000. Mm. So, I, 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 that's what, but again, I haven't looked at his model exactly. Right. So I, I'm yeah. just going off of what you've given to me. I think, so I don't know how you would structure that or how you would work within that. I think to, from, to what, from what I understand and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know a, a, a enough about Tim's, to, Tim's program to answer this fully. And I am planning on actually reaching out to him and see if he wants to come on the show. Um, okay. cause it'd be very interesting, but I think he's very upfront with people at the start about, okay, what do you want to achieve? What's possible? What's not, um, and understanding, okay. you know, what metrics are important to them and then trying to make them, uh, you know, trying to set some kind of realistic goals. Um, his business at the moment focuses on helping brides get ready for their weddings um, <laughs> and, and the money he's charging is insane it's like well, it's, again it's all relative but he'll charge i believe 12k for like a holy tra- shit <laughs> right you know um and it just really opened my mind up to what is possible in that space you know so long as you're um yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's no like anything. It's hard graft, right? Like every this is the thing. Like going back to what I was saying earlier to you, it's like, oh, I'll do this coaching thing on the side, and I was looking at that, going, I can become like a high value coach. Um, but then it's like any new venture, any new arm to your business. You know, you open the bonnet up and you realize, oh crap, this is like months and months of work. Like, like yes, I'm yeah. quite knowledgeable about health and fitness, but I'm not yet a qualified personal trainer. And there's a big difference between being knowledgeable about health and fitness and nutrition and being a good coach they're two different things right and so i quickly different i quickly realized wow this is a ton of work and it's going to detract from my main passion so you know not not for now or may i may never do that you know uh, and and put it aside Um, but i do think that if going back to what we're saying, if you really care about helping people and I think there's a way you can fuse, you know, this, this kind of coaching high income model with something like in-home high intensity training for people, you know? Oh, I, listen, I, I fully agree. I think, you know, you know, to your point about, you know, the possibilities, I think sometimes what happens, um, and, and I'm guilty of this. So, you know, I'm speaking from my own experience is you know, you, you kind of block yourself in terms of what you think people are going to pay for a service, right? Um, and, and it's not even necessarily justified. Like, you know, 12000 for when – you, when, you, when you look at the numbers, 12000 seems astronomical until you look at what most people spend on a wedding. Right. You're right? Like, you're right? So, so if she's spending, you know, ten, I don't know, $10,000 on a dress, is it unreasonable to say that she wouldn't spend $12,000 to look fantastic in that dress? Um, you know – 
it was as soon as you take kind of take away your blinders with it and 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 the doubts of of what people are going to pay people pay stupid amounts of money for for lots of things like lots of what you know i would consider and you know useless they consider like an investment so um you know i think to your point yeah there's there's a ton of possibilities and opportunities that are probably not even been explored by by most people uh in terms of markets that you know we you know we haven't thought about um you know where where I would love to figure out to do is is how do you bring, you know, being able to still make money, but how do you bring like hit to people that don't have the money? Because one of the you know like uh, like Gary was talking about you know you had him on he was talking about the CEOs right these executives that have the cash that have the, but wouldn't it be great if we could figure out how to do it? For the people that don't have the money, the people that don't have those resources that are never going to get to use MedX per se, because you know, you know, the cost of going into a gym that has it is 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 not cheap. Um, you know, uh, how can you bring it to them in a, in a way that's effective? Because it's fine to say, well, here's a book, watch a YouTube video, but that's never going to be the same as having somebody coach you through it, you know, and having that support. So there, there's another way of you know, you know, not going after the big numbers, but still trying to figure out how can we, you know, support these people and make money doing it at the same time the only way i can see that working is if you've got like some government funded organization that is then delivering you know this really cost-effective supervised strength training to you know yeah. the, the um the the people that don't have the money because because it's not going to be a profitable business it, I, I just it, can't it, see exactly that. Yeah. No, I, no, I, I mean, that's why that's why I said like that's the you know the creative part of how, how how can that become a possibility? And the reality is, do you you know I, on my end, I wouldn't want the government involved in in telling me how to train somebody. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like all of a sudden now I've got these parameters I have to follow. I have to do it this way. I can't do this. And now and now I've got all these limitations placed upon me because the government is funding the project. It's still better than nothing, but it's just the idea that I, I think I think that becomes a slippery slope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Lo- logically, though, it'd be that's kind of where you want to get to, isn't it? You want it to be like, you know, uh, uh, sort of a not necessarily government, but like some type of um, some type of like plan that addresses how do we get all these people who are, you know, um, suffering from you know osteoporosis, sarcopenia, you know, their physical capability is declining with age and they've got no cash. How do we get these people fit and healthy? Um, exactly. And it has to and- be, a, it's, it's huge. It's so important. I mean, I don't know how that, how, how that is going to be, uh, addressed. And- I, I and, and you know what I don't know that there's an easy answer. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, your healthcare system is similar to mine, right? In terms of Canada and the UK. Well, um, the UK's got NHS, which is actually pretty decent. Um, although the, the, the English listeners listen to this, why not? Like, <laughs> you might not agree with me. But um, the NHS is basically free, or you pay for it through. Um, you kind of taxed a small amount. Um, yeah. From your paycheck, but um, it's it's great. I mean, it's all free. It's pretty Pretty, it functions quite well. I mean, everyone's had bad experiences, but uh, you know, plenty of people had good experiences too. Um, and what's interesting because now that I live in Ireland, I don't have the NHS, so I have to pay for uh, oh, for healthcare. Okay. And I recently had a, a for Christmas, I tore my calf playing basketball, and I couldn't oh, that's walk. Right, yeah. I, I had to be, I had to be. Uh, oh yeah, forget you, you listen to that one. Um, I had to, be, <laughs> I had to be uh, driven to A and E, uh, you know, accident emergency following yeah. the session um, to to. to to get someone to look at it and to, to, to sort of diagnose and, and, you know, show me how to, to fix it. Um, and I was waiting from 8 PM to 1130 at night for someone to see me, uh, you know, in A and E and this is like on a Sunday night. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I had to pay a hundred euro, which is what, like just over a hundred dollars, uh, for, for just for admittance, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I don't know how dissimilar that is to the healthcare in, in the U S and, and in Canada. Um, but but that was mad, and I just thought, God, I'm I'm so grateful for all the NHS treatment I've had in the past, completely free of charge, you know. Yeah, no, we're I mean we're fortunate here as well, right? So we've got Medicare, which uh, I think is pretty uh, pretty pretty similar to the UK. Um, but the same thing, like you do not want to show up with an injury that's not life threatening. Well, let's be honest, you don't want to show up with a with a life threatening problem, <laughs> period. But ideally, but um, you know. On, on a weekend, you show up at the ER. I mean, they're 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 unfortunately they're understaffed, they're overworked, um, and so you're going to wait three or four hours. I remember years back playing ice hockey without a helmet, just a, a pickup game, and skating backwards caught my caught the blade, uh, caught the edge of the skate in a rut. I went flying back, 
and slammed down hard on the ice. Didn't lose consciousness, no concussion. But I'm lying there kind of cursing and I'm looking and one of my buddies comes over and he and he looks down and he's like, Oh fuck, that's a lot of blood. So we we packed up snow into a t shirt, you know, put it on back of my head and, and went to uh went to the ER, a uh, local hospital near me. And uh thank God. So heart heart problems and head injuries uh take priority. So uh I needed sixteen stitches to close it up. It was bleeding everywhere. Um and so they saw me right away. So there was no uh there was no waiting. But uh yeah, for things like a calf tear, if you go in, you know, out here it'd be the same thing. You know, anything like that, it's not it's not considered an emergency relative to whatever 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 else they have in queue. Um, so you just yeah you'll you'll wait for hours and hours. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there were people in far worse condition than me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To be fair, I, I'm sort of hobbling around with a basketball in one hand and a uh, sports bag <laughs> in the other is quite humorous, really. Um, <laughs> is there anything else you want to add? I mean, we've got, kind of digressed a little bit. Is there, <laughs> yeah, is, there, <laughs> is there anything else you want to add on the uh, in-home business side of things? Any f- questions you feel are unanswered? I think we've covered it quite well, but I just wondered if there's anything else yeah, on that. I, I, let me just check location market. Yeah, I mean, I think we pretty much hammered it. I, I think, like I said, figure out your market. Um, if, if you know, Assuming you've done the other stuff that we talked about in terms of getting into the industry, um, if, if you're going to go the route of, uh, of going in home, like look at what you want to target. Uh, it'll make things easier because then you know when you're looking at your location uh if you happen to be an area where there's a ton of condos well you know every every decently built condo is going to have a gym um so you have access to that equipment you also have access to a whole bunch of people in a building um and maybe that's going to save you time because you're just effectively going door to door um if you happen to be more in a um uh, like a corporate setting where you're in a financial district maybe you're going to an office building that happens to have a you know, a facility in there and you can just contract out of that space. So, you know, you know, we're talking in home, but realistically you can, you know, you can travel to wherever, you know, wherever you think you can make money doing it, where you're going to help the, the population that you're hoping to help. So uh, that, that's, you know, maybe I'll finish with that, but awesome. yeah, that's how I do it. Well, just before we wrap up, if you've got time, Craig, um, yeah. I'd be very interested. Do you, do you run your own facility now? Is that correct? Yeah. So I, yeah. So, uh, just I'll, interest in the transition for you. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a long story even longer. Um, I, uh, so from the in-home, when I got body by science, I, I read the book, I did the transitions. Uh, I was fortunate. One of my in-home clients owns, uh, owns an aeronautical uh, company, um, called MHD, uh, a guy by the name of, uh, Brian Dollimore, who was, uh, he's, who's just been fantastic, uh, you know, with me in terms of helping me out. And we ended up putting a, uh, it was a, about 500 square feet. He gave me an office space. Uh, literally it was an office next to other offices that he wasn't using. He said, you know, gave me a key. There was a side entrance. I went in and I, I fitted it with, uh, 11, it was 11 pieces of Kaiser pneumatic equipment. Cause that's what I could afford at the time. And I drove down about six hours, loaded these uh, pieces out of, a. it was from a, another gym, loaded them to a truck along with my, uh, at the time, uh, my father would have been about 78 years old, I think helping me out. And, and another guy, another client of mine, actually, who was even sixties. So they came down with me and we loaded all of the, these 11 pieces in a massive compressor and everything. And, uh, I ran 250 feet of line through a warehouse. Cause I couldn't, cause the compressor was so loud. It's one of these big things. Uh, I couldn't put it in the space cause it was just overbearing. So we put it in uh, Brian's warehouse. We ran all this line through all the rafters and everything else. And, and that's how it started. So I was using, uh, I was using Kaiser pneumatic, not on a 1010 uh, body by science cadence, because if you've ever used the pneumatic stuck stuff, uh, it's fine if you're at a bit of a clip, but it's not designed for, uh, for slow movement at all. Um, and there's other issues with it as well. But, uh, anyways, it served the purpose at the time. Uh, MHD moved locations. So I actually moved with them and, uh, we ended up putting in a, uh, which is where I'm at now. It's a 1400 square foot space. Uh, I've got showers, uh, so women's and men's, um, I'm using Medex, uh, the big five plus lumbar. I've got, uh, a self-propelled treadmill called a uh, high trainer pro, which, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this thing, but it's, I, I had a, I watched your video. It's pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. I think if, uh, if I had to it's choose the biggest like, treadmill I've ever seen. Oh, the thing is amazing. And I don't know if you saw on the screen, like all the analytics it gives you, right? 
Like, yeah, and I'm so. not a metric. Like, yeah, I, like I'm not a metric guy. Like, I could, like, I know right now the the trend is to really just track and 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 check everything. I'm sort of old school in terms of like I use OneNote for my clients, and I just log their time under tension. I log their reps and exercise and that. Um, so I don't have a proper spreadsheet set up or anything. Um, but the high trainer is just it's phenomenal because I could use it to basically determine uh, imbalances on clients, and yeah, it's and it's brutal. It is just friggin' brutal. So I've got one of those. I've got uh, two TRXs set up. I've got a hammer strength uh, squat rack. Um, and then I've got a Dynavec uh, gluteator. So I've got all that set up in the space. Um, and then I've got a few kettlebells because I still, I, like, I got certified with that uh, years ago and I still like playing around with them. Um, I know it, it's not the most popular in HIT uh, in terms of, uh, you know, exercises, but um, I, you know, again, safety is paramount for me. So I don't, like, I don't do the overhead snatches. I, I'll do swings. I'll do some cleans. I'll do some presses. Um, again, mainly just to use my own creativity to limit the amount, uh, to limit what I can do with it, right? So if a kettlebell goes from 36 to 55 pounds, I got to come up with a way to get the 55 pound to move if I can't, you know, if I, if I can't do it, how can I jump from one to the other? So it, it just creates a little bit of, for me, it's fun to think through. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of reading on that. I'll play around with those. So I've got those sitting in the gym as well. Uh, some tubes for rehab and therapeutic uh, purposes. I've got my massage table in there. So yeah, it's, it, it's cool. I don't have a, oddly enough, I don't actually have a company name. Um, so the website I have is get hit, but that's you know that's about the extent of uh, any advertising or anything I do. And if you look at the website, it's a it's a Weebly special, um, and I put it up there because somebody said you should have a website. So that's that's what I did. <laughs> and you've got is, is that? Um, but but that being said, you've got a. I'm assuming you have a regular flow of clients coming through there now. Yeah, so I've got a regular flow of clients. I on assuming everybody's in town right now. I'm up to about fifty to fifty five sessions per week. Um, which is pretty good. Uh, but I need, what I want is, is to hit 60 to 65. Uh, and then I'll start uh, looking at maybe turning it into, um, how do I word this? I kind of treat it like I, I run it very low key. Um, I, I would almost call it hobby like, uh, in a sense, I'm very relaxed in terms of the way I do things. I don't stress out. I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm moving locations, uh, in May um actually i've got two things kind of going and, and i don't even know how i managed to do it but uh, but I've, I'll, I'll end up operating out of two locations one will be solely the one that i have now and then the other one is uh, with somebody else's company um the one i'm going to be moving to um that at that point when i do go um i will have an official sign out uh, an official you know name for the facility which i'm kind of working on now um but like like little quirks of my own personality will be seen throughout it's so like I'm a, I'm a big pop culture guy so i love my movies i love my music so you're going to see a lot of uh, and the music's going to be vinyl like i'm not going to be playing cds i'm not going to be playing you know mp3s it's vinyl only like that's that's going to be the first thing uh next thing is a lot of old like rock concert uh, posters that i've got uh and then the inspirational old bodybuilding stuff like that like it's just i want it to be a representation of how i think awesome. and how i operate yeah so so that's pretty much what it's going to be yeah so w w when it gets to that then you know the, the website will look a little different but for the time being yeah how do you pronounce your last name is it hubbard uh hubert H -E 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 -E. even better Hub yeah hubert hit hubert's yeah. hit like Hubert said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, exactly." There we go. Hubert said, "I actually, I'll, I'll throw this out there, and somebody, I can guarantee somebody's going to register this quickly." But uh, one of the ones I was thinking of was uh, a little play on words that would only be caught by those of us in the industry. But I was going to call it "outside the box," which was my little dig at CrossFit. But <laughs> <laughs> I love but, it. Uh, I, yeah, I, I ran it by a couple of clients, and they all kind of looked at me like, "What? I don't get it." Yeah, it's not. It doesn't scream fitness, does it? Is the problem. No, uh, no. And perhaps you should remove little... remove hit from the name if it will, and uh, ignore my suggestion on that. Um, <laughs> as as we've been talking about. Um, now, this is uh, Craig. This has been really, really fun. Um, what's the best way for people to find out more about you? Um, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm not really on social media or anything like that. I'm not. Uh, I, I don't have a problem with it. I just don't do it. So um, my my suggestion would be you can look. Drop me an email. Uh, it's cr very easy. Craig at gethit.ca. So g e t h i t uh, dot c a. Or you know look me up on Facebook. Uh, it's uh, just under my name. It's Craig Hubert. It's my personal account. But I'm you know just don't spam me and bombard me with you know stuff. Are we not, are we not friends on Facebook yet? 
No, no, but we could be in the next like, five minutes. We definitely should be. Um, I had no idea. Um, yeah, no. Um, and as, as, uh, for all everyone listening, um, if you want to get access to all of the resources, everything that, that Craig and I have mentioned on this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Craig, and that will take you directly to the blog post for this one. Um, and to get access to all of the episodes, go to corporatewarrior.org. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com. That's C-O-R-P warrior.com to get your free high intensity training, Google progress chart and ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Bill De Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss and overall health in an efficient, effective and sustainable way. These transcripts are deliberately not verbatim. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results to get your ebook head on over to corpwarrior.com enter your email address then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link once you click the link you will be instantly redirected to a pdf version of the transcripts